Star Trek as a show has always been about how humanity can improve itself through the application of science and technology. These ideals are ultimately ideals of the 1960s, a time in which technology was advancing at an even more rapid pace than today in many respects. And yet, despite this, there are aspects of Star Trek which are very much non-scientific and non-technological, and which once again can be attributed to the fact that it was made in the 1960s. Certain aspects of the universe resemble shows more like The Twilight Zone than any kind of hard science fiction, and one such example can be seen in the use of telepathy in Star Trek. Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media, and today, yes, I'm going to be talking about telepathy in Star Trek. The main reason I'm doing this is because of the video I did on the Remans, and the Remans are also a species which exhibit some telepathic capabilities. And then there's the whole question about what kind of telepathy actually makes sense within the Star Trek universe. So today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at various examples of telepathic species or telepaths in the Star Trek universe, and is there a scientific, biological explanation for their capabilities. I think it's worth noting that, as I said, in the 1960s, programs like The Twilight Zone were still very popular, and the idea of the supernatural and extrasensory perception were still very, very common ideas and sort of commonly held. That all goes back historically, technically, to like the very early stages of the 20th century with occultism and and uh, 19th century mysticism. It's fair to say that it was something that was fairly commonly held and found its way into Star Trek because, well, it was part of the zeitgeist, much like how discussions of genetic engineering were very much in the cultural zeitgeist in the 1960s. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go through basically chronologically and look at the different examples of telepaths in Star Trek and see can we find a scientific explanation for their capabilities? So, let's get right into it. So, of course, the first and foremost of the telepathic species in Star Trek, the original, are the Vulcans. And this is brought in as early as original Star Trek. The interesting thing is that it is tactile-based, and that actually in TOS, there are limits to Mr. Spock's telepathic capabilities. He can do mind melds with almost anything, but they're not necessarily the most sensible thing to be doing, and also yeah, they aren't necessarily always the most accurate gauges. The interactions with different species through the mind meld can be quite distorted because of, well, the differences in the mind that he is interacting with, which we'll get on to. But it's first fair to say that with Mr. Spock, his telepathic abilities are based on tactile contact. And it's also worth saying that the primary purpose of the mind meld is to mind meld with other Vulcans. The fact that they can mind meld with other humanoids and even non-humanoids is more of a coincidence. And as you say, the further away you get from mind melding with Vulcans, the less sort of reliable and clear the communication is between the two consciousness. The other thing to note is that it has physiological effects. Mind melding is dangerous and it has consequences for the body. And as I say, it's only partially effective on non-Vulcan species and there is considerable risk involved to both parties. In terms of how or why this can work, what I would suggest is that there are open neurons in the fingertips of Vulcans, and these are designed to tap into the neuroelectric signals of other Vulcans. This is also why mind meld is initiated via facial contact. That's always by uh, contact with the face, so that you're as close to the brain signals, the brain neurons, as possible. And so through the mind meld, they can conduct those neural signals across to the other person, and then that can be translated into their brain. And of course, basically replicate the thought patterns of one person in another person. Which does, I think, have some scientific precedent. I'm not exactly sure, but I know that that is something that is being looked into with neural science and the ability for people to send neural signals between one another through technology. So, 
it does actually make some sense in terms of mirroring brain activity. After all, thoughts are fundamentally electrical signals. And because they are electrical signals, they can be transcribed. As I say, once you get onto non-Vulcan species, there's obviously an element of uncertainty in the transcription. And so while with humans, a Vulcan mind meld is actually relatively reliable because humans and Vulcans neurologically aren't colossally different, when you get to something like, let's say, a Horta, which is a completely different form of life, it becomes much, much harder. And as I say, there is dangers because you are tapping into the other person's nervous system Obviously, you're feeling all they're feeling, but it also means that they can be damaged to your nervous system as well. And another aspect to bring up are, of course, katras. That is the soul of a Vulcan. Now, again, this is a bit weird because this is a very mystical, spiritualist thing to talk about. You know, your immortal soul. What I think we can actually say is that the, the katra is the brainwave pattern. It's, I suppose, the base building block algorithm of a mind, the, the certain way in which each individual mind operates, uh, a collection of base nervous system signals, and that those can be transferred just as much as thoughts can be transferred in the mind meld. So can a katra, uh, as a series of electrical signals, pass through the nervous system and brain waves, those can also be passed on to another host. So, in terms of the realism of Vulcan mind melds as a form of telepathy, because it is based in tactile contact, that actually gives it a lot of realism, and because of its limitations as well. Star Trek is very, very clear about the limits of Vulcan mind melds, and that they can only go so far, and that they are dangerous undertakings. The Katra is a bit more of a stretch, and it does bring out interesting metaphysical ideas about where is the soul, where is the body, where is the mind, and, you know, that's ultimately dependent on what your spiritual viewpoint is. Are you a Platonist or are you an Aristotelian? That's basically going to affect whether or not uh, what you think of that idea of the the soul being a collection of brain waves, thought patterns, and, you know, electrical signals which can be passed into another brain. So, I think, as I say, it's fair to say that as an expression or as a portrayal of telepathy, the Vulcans stand up pretty well to scrutiny. Now, moving on to Next Generation, which in many ways is even more based in some of the wackier ideas of the 1960s than indeed original series is. Uh, not least of that is with the Betazoids. This is a very, very powerful form of telepathy. Uh, if this is a non-tactile form of telepathy, they don't need to touch you to feel your thoughts. It is passive, it is always active, and it is, as I say, literally telepathy. Diana Troy just being an empath, that's just a nerf. But certainly for most Betazoids, particularly the well-trained ones like Luoxana, they have just full full Professor X levels of telepathy. I mean, I don't know if they can necessarily control someone via telepathy. Maybe they just have a law against it because they definitely have that potential. So this is going to be a difficult one to explain biologically. But I'm going to try. So what I'm going to try is explain it through a biological phenomenon that does exist in the world. So some of you may be aware that some creatures possess the ability of electroreception. That is the ability to detect electrical signals, heartbeat, muscle movements, all those kind of things. One of the main species which does this, perhaps the most famous species, are the sharks. It's also worth noting that actually the design of the Betazoids coincidentally kind of lends some credence to this explanation. Sharks are known for having black eyes, and what do Betazoids have? Black eyes. That's probably just a bit of coincidence, but it would serve as a little bit of support to this idea. So the way electroreception works for sharks is the electrical signals, the electrical impulses, are conducted through the water by the salt particles, and then that's picked up by the ampule of Lorenzini, which are these little pores on the nose of the shark. So that's why that works, is because there is a medium present in the water that allows the transmission of those signals to a receiver. Now, with Betazoids, this gets a little bit more complicated, because, of course, 
we're doing it into thin air? Apparently so. Maybe there's some kind of particles in the air which can conduct brainwaves, thought patterns, or, you know, the neural impulses. Again, these are electrical signals. And perhaps the betazoid sensors are so attuned that not only can they detect in these electrical signals of other beings around them, but that also they can even detect what kind of temperament or mood that the person is in, which could be helpful in terms of avoiding threat scenarios. Are you in presence of other animals? Are they safe or are they hostile? That would actually be quite useful. And we could argue that perhaps the ability to sense thoughts comes from further training and honing of that skills to then better understand the actual thought patterns going on. Again, how how accurate their telepathy is, is questionable, especially when our main example is Luxana Troy, who is, you know, not necessarily always a reliable source. So maybe it's through just general electromagnetic fields, but then, okay, well, when you're on a starship or a Faraday cage, is that interfered with? It's not a perfect explanation, but I think it has some merit. The other than stranger thing is that they can transmit thoughts into other telepathic minds and also non-telepathic minds. And that's a bit more strange. I think you can make sense of it that they could project a telepathic thought, but I don't know how you wouldn't just broadcast that to everyone, given that you're in contact with all these other uh, nervous systems and brains through this electromagnetic field, through this, you know, whatever it is, through this form of electroreception, that those brains would also receive that signal. Do you code it in a certain way that only the recipient, that only the recipient's brain can understand it, and it's just nothing to anyone else? I don't know. Or indeed, was everyone hearing all the conversations that Luxana and Diana were having on the Enterprise? That would be quite embarrassing. Probably not for Loxana. We then run into even bigger problems, though, because apparently included in this form of telepathy is the ability to sense the thoughts of people who are several light years away through a screen. And you could make the argument of, oh, well, she's sensing it through the subspace connection. And I'm going to say, let's not do that, because my goal here is to avoid just resorting to subspace, because I don't think that that works as a biological explanation. I don't think anyone would biologically evolve connections to subspace, because why? Why would you ever do that? Why would that ever be useful in, you know, evolving on a planet? So I don't see that as a really very good explanation. And that, I'm just going to say that... Luxana or Diana, whenever they're whenever they're talking to Romulans across the neutral zone, you know, several light years away, and she says, He's lying, Captain. He's hiding something, Captain. No shit, Diana. Whenever that happens, that she's she's just bullshitting, or she's she's using her counselor training rather than her uh, empathic abilities, because there's no way. And again, even the ability to detect the thoughts of people on other starships, like how those are in their own little contained box of electromagnetic fields and energy, and between you and them is a vacuum of space. Like I say, on a planet, sure, there might be some delay, there may be some difference in terms of its range, and so perhaps Betazoids are better able to read the minds of people nearby as opposed to people further away. And once again, if we take it back to that idea of, well, perhaps it was used as a form of threat detection when the Betazoid species was evolving on their planet, that would make some sense. Obviously, the closer minds are of greater concern than those that are further afield. And again, it can be explained that you'd get better at that with training and honing your skills so that you could reach out to the entire planet and actually establish contact with specific minds. Interestingly, that whole level of telepathy would mean that telecommunication would probably never develop on Beta Z because why would you need a phone? You can just, with a little bit of training, talk directly to people via the use of telepathy, interestingly enough. So, <laughs> like I say, there is some biological explanation for this form of telepathy, but it can't go enough to explain 
why it is so overpowered as we see it in Next Generation. What we see in Next Generation is just above and beyond any biological explanation of telepathy. And again, I think that goes back to when TNG was actually conceived of. And in fact, you know, telepathy remained a very popular thing. So our final example is from the Remans. We don't get a huge amount of information about Riemann telepathy. And again, it does run into similar problems of Betasoid telepathy. There are a couple of interesting things to note. The first thing to note is that it's both transmissible, but also uses direct tactile contact. So our example is, of course, is Ron Perlman as um, Shinzon's viceroy. He seems to have telepathic abilities. Now, why does he have telepathic abilities? Is it because the Remans as a species have telepathic potential? Perhaps. And then the other half of it is that the Romulans, of course, because they're descended from Vulcans, would have telepathic potential. And given that we see the Viceroy mind melding with Shinzon, basically, I mean, look at where his hands are. His hands are on his head. That looks like a Vulcan mind meld. So there's perhaps reason to believe that there was actually intermixing between Romulans and Remans, interbreeding between the two species, which means that certain Vulcanoid traits, like the ability to conduct mind melds by use of tactile contact, were then passed down through Remans, maybe as a recessive gene, maybe it's a, it's a one in a million ability, but certainly we do see that it is present. Moving beyond that to the sort of more broad, long-range telepathy that we see them use to attack Deanna, you could argue that it is some kind of evolution of echolocation, maybe through ultra-high or ultra-low frequencies, these extreme frequencies of sound waves that are so far beyond the audible perception that your subconscious perceives them and thus can receive those signals. That would make some sense, given what the Remans look like. They look like they are descended in some way from bats. So that would have some a bit of merit there. And then also consider their environment. Their environment is dark. We don't know necessarily if the Remans were tunnel dwellers, uh, but certainly they've been tunnel dwellers for a long time, so perhaps that led to them enhancing their abilities. You know, direct communication is difficult in tunnels. And also, not to mention sometimes dangerous, you can cause a cave-in. And so the ability to communicate non-verbally through these ultrasonic sound waves would, again, make some sense in terms of a survival trait. Once again, we run into the problem, well, how then does it reach across the gulf of space? And I don't really have a very good explanation for that. The other thing to point out is that these sound waves are then processed as almost a visual contact, which again, I don't know how you would necessarily translate these so correctly between two different species. I don't know how how you could send these signals in such a way that it would then affect the visual cortex of the recipient. That's a bit strange as well. So once again, we run into the difficulties of the vast gulf of space, but I think there is some explanation, both from the idea of interbreeding between Romulans and Remans, and then also from the fact that the Remans are a bat-like species that would probably have some form of echolocation and other hypersonic forms of communication that to us would appear like telepathy, but perhaps to them it's just an extension of language used in lieu of verbal language. Think about how hand signals, not just sign language, but hand signals can often be used when language, verbal language can't be used for whatever reason. So to wrap up, I think these days we'd say that ideas like telepathy in sci-fi is really more the providence of franchises like Dune or Star Wars. You know, the stuff that is far more fantastical in its presentation and, you know, doesn't necessarily deal in modern science and biology and physics in the way that Star Trek does or did. But I think what we can say here is that there are biological explanations. And while telepathy may seem remarkable and absurd to us, 
bearing in mind we're talking about aliens here. And, you know, once again, go back to that Leonard Nimoy explanation for Mr. Spock. This was actually about Mr. Spock and the Vulcan nerve pinch. But it's just as applicable here. And he said to the producer, he said, well, you know, this man is an alien. He might have abilities and understanding of the human anatomy that we don't. So, you know, that was his explanation for the Vulcan nerve pinch. And that's kind of the approach we should take to alien species. We don't, we don't know what they can do. That's the whole point of Star Trek is that we can have aliens that do very different things. Too often we just have aliens that are just humans with stuff on their face and that's not necessarily that interesting. When you introduce things like telepathy and then you actually develop those ideas and you think about those ideas. Uh, the Voyager episode where Balana gets in trouble for spreading violent thoughts among a peaceful planet of telepaths that's quite uh, that's quite interesting and so that's what star trek allows us to do and explore so i think there is still merit to having uh, telepathy in star trek i think it can tell some very interesting stories but we should try and keep in mind what is biologically realistic physics ultimately has sway over biology and there are hard limits when it comes to the vacuum and gulf of space and it doesn't matter how good your telepathy is you're not beating that. And the other thing to think about, just to wrap up, is that oftentimes telepathy is portrayed as this great way of communicating between minds and these telepathic species, the Telosians. They feel so superior because they have moved beyond the need for verbal communication. But another thing to consider, particularly when you're engaging in telepathic contact between different species, different minds, different ways of seeing the universe and seeing life, is that thought can be just as cryptic as language. So thank you all for watching. Leave your thoughts in the comments below, and I will see you all in the next video. Thank you to my members for supporting the channel. My glorious Navarks, Tully DT, Rella, David Reeves, Macross Schaffer, and Sean Farrell. My loyal commanders, Philip Ty, Birdmonster, Jeff Hallam, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Narata, Nathaniel Mead, Gabe Logan, Adam Bowman, Nicholas Walsh, JC Tech Wizard, Alcara Dreamer, Joe G, Scotty O, and Der Monarch. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ocalcatum Quaesto, John Nicole, Athy's Collection, Tobias Klein, Marzarine, Bird of Play D3, Khan the Skeptal Overlord, David Jackson, Andy Clark, and Guy Haslam. And I thank all my loyal sub lieutenants. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.